I'll reconvene this meeting of the Waco ISD Board of Trustees. We've been in closed session under Texas Government Code 551.071, 551.072, and 551.074. Welcome you, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. Thank you for being with us. This regular business meeting of the Waco Independent School Board is hereby called to order. All items discussed or voted upon this evening have been posted as required by state law. I want to extend a warm welcome to those present and to those in our viewing audience as well. The board's purpose is to set goals, listen to reports of the superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and make policy for the district. We are not here to make management decisions or solve problems of individuals. Management is the responsibility of the superintendent as his staff. At this time, I'd ask you to turn off your cell phones or silent your phones if you've not already done so. We appreciate the time you have taken to join us and for your interest in the Waco Independent School District. At this time, if everyone would join me for a few moments as we pause for prayer, contemplation, reflection, or meditation. Thank you. At this time, Superintendent Nelson, we're ready for Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I'll turn it over to our Executive Director of Communications and Family Engagement, Mr. Kyle DeBeer, to lead us through this part of the agenda. Mr. DeBeer. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, this evening, we have students from the Greater Waco Advanced Healthcare Academy to lead us in the pledge. I'd like to introduce Marissa Boteo and uh, Takira, Takira Kashan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If you would please join me in front of the dais for tonight's special recognitions. We'll begin the special recognition portion of our meeting with an introduction of tonight's pledge leaders who are both second year students at the Greater Waco Advanced Healthcare Academy. Marissa Bateo is a senior at University High School and says her favorite subject in school is English. In her spare time, she plays the trumpet in the varsity band and is a member of the National Honor Society. She also enjoys reading, learning about psychology and playing video games. Marissa's teacher at Guaca says that she is the type of student who has a willingness and eagerness to learn. She constantly displays a positive attitude and can be depended on to always be in compliance with all established policies and procedures. Marissa is a strong student and a role model for her peers and will be a great addition to the healthcare community. When she finishes her high school education, Marissa wants to pursue a career as a neuroscientist. Marissa's parents, Jesse and Elaine Boteo, are both employees of Waco ISD and are here with us tonight. I'd like to ask you to stand so that we can recognize you. Thank you for raising such a wonderful daughter and sharing her with us. Takira Kasha is a senior at Waco High School and says that her favorite subject in school is math. She's a member of the UHS Highlighters Drill Team. In her spare time, she also sings in the choir and is a member of the praise team at Open Door Church of God in Christ. Takira's teacher at Guaca says she has a positive disposition in the classroom and clinical settings. She helps others when needed and enjoys learning new skills. 
Takira enjoys working with others and is a friendly face on campus. She will also be a wonderful asset to the medical industry. After high school, Takira wants to pursue a career as a registered nurse in the Mothers and Infants Unit or the Emergency Department. Takira's father, Carlton Kashaw Jr., was unable to attend this evening, but she is joined by her mother, Kimberly Oliver. Uh, Ms. Oliver, would you please stand so that we may recognize you as well? Thank you for sharing your daughter with us tonight. We also want to say thank you to our Adopt-A-School partner, Barnes & Noble, for donating the books and gift cards that our pledge leaders are receiving this evening. <clears throat> Beginning in 2014, the Texas Association of School Boards initiated an annual program to recognize businesses that generously support their school districts. Waco ISD knows firsthand the value of what we receive from these business organizations and other community groups. These partnerships enrich the experience for our students and their generosity really does make a difference on our campuses every day. Uh, this evening we're gonna recognize the first of two groups of businesses that have been honored as TAS through the TASB Business Recognition Program. And tonight I'd like to begin by introducing Ed Page representing HEB. He's the Director of Retail Operations. And Alex Thompson, the Unit Director at the Wooded Acres Store. HEB supports our campuses in a number of different ways, but they are also the main sponsor for the HEB Celebrity Cook-Off, which benefits the Waco ISD Education Foundation. And through our Adopt-A-School program, they've partnered with Bells Hill, Cedar Ridge, Crestview, Kendrick, Parkdale, and South Waco. Representing Coca-Cola, we're joined by Rhonda Donahue. Coca-Cola was a longtime major sponsor of the HEB Celebrity Cook-Off, benefiting the Education Foundation and in that way has contributed to help raise funds for innovative new ideas in Waco ISD classrooms. Representing Community Bank and Trust tonight is Lisa Hull, a senior trust officer and CPA. Community Bank and Trust serves as an adopt-a-school partner at Alta Vista Elementary and Waco High School. They were also a table sponsor for the 2017 HEB Celebrity Cook-Off. We're pleased to have Zach Depew and Bethany Evans from Tractor Supply with us tonight. Tractor Supply is an adopt-a-school partner at GW Carver Middle School. And representing Lowe's of Waco, we have Gary Moss, the store manager, and Rod Serrano, the assistant store manager. Lowe's is a very active Adopt-A-School partner, both at the district level and at Lake Air Montessori. They offer an in-store discount for all district employees, have donated tools to the Greater Waco Advanced Manufacturing Academy, and were a major live auction sponsor for the 2017 HEB Celebrity Cook-Off. I also wanted to recognize a couple of our business partners that TASB is recognizing this year who weren't able to join us tonight. Uh, Members Choice Credit Union, Roman Novian Codewell Banker Realtors, Window World of Waco, and Waco Motorsports. Uh, also recognizing NEI Datacom, Texas Farm Bureau, Grande Communications, and Central National Bank who is an active partner and event sponsor for us as well. Please join me once again in thanking all of our business partners that we're recognizing this evening. Last month, we recognized students who earned a perfect score on their third grade reading or math star assessments. And this month, we're excited to continue recognizing elementary students who earned the distinction of a perfect score on their star assessments last spring. 
Uh, to begin with, I'd first like to recognize a new student to Waco ISD, Jody Vizcaya of Kendrick Elementary, who earned a perfect score in her district last year, and we're pleased to have her joining Kendrick and joining Waco ISD. And now with perfect scores on their fourth grade star mathematics test, I'm pleased to introduce Daisy Barco from Kendrick. <laughs> Tyree Kendricks from Lake Air Montessori. and Shazam Murphy-Jones from West Avenue. We're recognizing several students tonight who received perfect scores on their fourth grade reading test. Uh, Lydia Allen from Hillcrest was unable to join us this evening, but we do have with us Ayana Flores from Bells Hill. And Cassandra Garcia, who currently attends Indian Spring Middle School, but was a student at Cedar Ridge last year. Marshall Gilmore received a perfect score on the star reading test as a fifth grade student at Hillcrest. Marshall currently attends Tennyson. Vianne Ramos was at West Avenue and scoring a perfect score last year and is now at Indian Spring Middle School. <laughs> Andre Rodriguez was at Dean Highland last year when he, Andre aced the star reading test. He's currently at Cesar Chavez Middle School. With perfect scores on their fifth grade star science test, I'd like to introduce Noe Medina, who was at Bells Hill. And currently attends Cesar Chavez. And Jose Perez, who attended Cedar Ridge last year and has advanced to Tennyson Middle School. And the uh, last student that I would like to recognize tonight is Jude Wendell. Last year, Jude was a fifth grade student at Crestview Elementary. He currently attends Tennyson Middle School. And he earned a perfect score on both his fifth grade star reading assessment and his fifth grade star mathematics assessment. <laughs> Congratulations again to all of our students with perfect scores. If you're the parent or a family member of one of these students, would you please stand so we can recognize you as well? Thank you for your support of your child and their education. We know the difference that that makes for these students and how much that contributes to their success. And with that, that concludes our special recognitions for this evening.
As some of our audience guests are, are uh, leaving this evening again, I want to congratulate all the students and their parents, as well as thank our business partners that were with us this evening. In terms of folks that are with us this evening, we've got a class from the Baylor School of Social Work that's here observing us tonight. Please stand up, stand up. We'd like to recognize you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. At this time, we'll proceed to item eight, but we have no uh, audience for guests at this time. So we'll proceed to item nine, the consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion. Or if you'd like an item uh, uh, pulled for further discussion, we can do that as well. I'm moving that they accept the uh, consent agenda. Okay, thank you, Mr. Manning. I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Tico. Any discussion, any questions? We'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll proceed to item 10, reports and discussion. Item A, report on 2017 delinquent tax collections. I see our uh, attorney friends hiding behind the support column. That's what collectors do. <laughs> <laughs> allow Ms. Davis, do you have any introductory comments uh, regarding our tax collections? I know that you monitor this the closest in our, on our team. Other than they do an excellent job with our tax collections, I'm, Robert was just telling me before the meeting that they continue to be up this year, so um, this is Robert Myers and Rick Bostwick with um, McCurry, the, the Selka, Bragg, and Allen, and a Beard, Colton, Brophy, and Bostwick. So they're, the two of them together um, do our tax collections. Thank you, gentlemen. Most of you I know and have seen in years past, and you've heard this uh, um, report and the good news is that the report is very similar to last year, which is a wonderful report. Uh, it shows that um, your collections uh, continue to, uh, frankly, increase. Uh, at this point, they're, in terms of current tax collections, you're collecting, before you turn it over, 98.7%, which is a remarkable percentage. Uh, and says, frankly, a lot about our community. Um, the economic status of the community and, frankly, the willingness of people in our community to meet their obligations, their legal obligations. Having said that, I would like to start by saying we appreciate and we do not take for granted the right uh, that you have extended to us to work for you. Uh, we value that. We, we, like I said, we don't take it for granted. Uh, it's an opportunity, and we treat it like that, particularly as it relates to your constituents, uh, to your students, 
uh, and frankly to Robert and my neighbors. Uh, we live in the district. Uh, our neighbors uh, and our children went to these to the to the schools here, and um, we understand that the process requires us to recognize that, and and in almost every instance, the few people that have problems paying taxes are not because. They don't want to. It's usually a sickness, uh, a specific situation uh, that makes it difficult for them. And we understand that. We understand that they are neighbors, constituents, parents and grandparents of students of WISD, and we do everything we can to work with them to make that process as easy on them as possible. Um, and. Y'all have directed us to do that. We take it very seriously, and we think that's a, a, a critical part of, of this process. Having said that, the news is good news. If you look at the uh, second uh, graph, uh, it's indicative of your annual tax collections, and the remarkable good news is that in every year for the last five, you have collected over a hundred percent of the levy uh, and and that is remarkable and the good thing about that is it provides a source of income that is continuous and predictable so that when you go to your budgeting process you have a, an identifiable dependable stream of income at least as it relates to property taxes I, possibly can't say as much for the state, but certainly for proper, local property taxes. If you'll go to the next graph, this is, indicates the collection of the tax levy, and really what this is indicative of is, you, uh, is, is what you collect in your first year is 98.80%. But by five years, you have collected almost 100% of your actual levy. Um, and, and that's remarkable. We'd like to take complete credit for it. We honestly can't. Uh, a lot of that is driven by the economy uh, and, the, and the community. And, um, and we have had the benefit of a good economy, and you're seeing that in these graphs. With that, I'll turn it over to Robert. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Members of the board, Dr. Nelson, I've just got a few charts and a few comments, and I know you're anxious to get on with your meeting. Uh, the, the, uh, oops. The, the chart that we have that shows three pie charts, these charts represent the tax that you turn over to us on an annual basis. Each July, you turn over to us the unpaid taxes from the prior year. The, the chart at the very top of this ch uh, chart is the, tax, is the pie chart that shows the taxes you turned over to us in July of 2017 that are the unpaid taxes from last year. And we've collected nearly 40% of those taxes in three months. And the other charts show the taxes you turned over to us in prior years. And as you can see, those taxes have almost nearly been collected. And as Rick was saying, we very conscientious about the process and procedures we go to contact our taxpayers uh, and help them assist them through their tax delinquency problems. And it's their ability to pay their taxes that really drives the collections. And as long as people have the money and have the jobs and have the ability and are, and are, obligate and ha are in a responsible persons, which for the most part is, a, is the overwhelming majority of the taxpayers and property owners of Waco ISD, this is the reflection, these high collection numbers are reflections of, of their situation and the ability of them to pay their taxes even when they're delinquent. H how we go about collecting these taxes, we send notice to these people, we open up dialogues with them, make phone calls, we do file some lawsuits when necessary to do so, and last year we filed over 200 lawsuits, we recovered 144 judgments, sold 144 properties, most of those properties are properties that are ones that are derelict properties that need to be rejuvenated through the tax foreclosure process, and people's homesteads don't get sold, uh, people's livelihoods don't get up, uh, upended simply because of the tax foreclosure things. That doesn't occur through the procedures that we undertake to collect the district's taxes. 
And I think uh, the success of what we have is due to the, the ability of your folks to pay and the procedures that we implement to get your taxes collected. And finally, the last thing, just to switch off of tax collections for a little bit, but still talking about property taxes, in addition to our tax collection services for the district, we also, in the last year, filed, these are technical audits with the comptroller's office to make aware of the Texas Education Agency that as every tax and jurisdiction, the district has had reductions in its tax levies over the years due to changes, normal changes in, in, in uh, adjustments to your taxes that occur after the taxes are initially levied. And we, we get the information from the appraisal district and we file these audit reports with the Texas Education Agency to have them recalculate the district's state aid based upon the fact that the district's property value decreased from the time it was first levied and calculated by the state when it funded the school district. The net result of all that is in the, for the two audits that we filed for tax year 2014 and 2015, the district has received, uh, these were preliminary numbers that I put in my report, uh, they're a little over a million dollars. In fact, I just checked with Ms. Davis and she tells me the district actually has recovered from the Texas Education Agency over $900,000 in additional state aid because of the audits that we filed for 2014 and 2015 to recoup uh, additional state aid the district is entitled to because of the reduction in your, in your taxable values. So in addition to the tax collection services that we provide to the district, we also monitor the district's property valuations and make sure that the district is given full credit by the Texas Education Agency in the state of Texas, as little as that may be, I may say, uh, for the, the, the values that the district is at. The district's values are, are strong, the tax growth is strong, the tax balances are strong, the levies are strong, but it's a normal adjustment process that most jurisdictions go through, and we were able to capture that information and forward it to the tax edu uh, te Texas Education Agency to make sure you get all that you're entitled to. We appreciate so much the opportunity to represent the district, to work with your taxpayers, your property owners to get these things collected, and to represent the district and work with your staff and yourselves to make sure the district has the funds necessary to, the most important thing is to get our kids educated. And we thank you very much. And we hope you got it done in a sufficient length of time, Dr. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Mr. Perez? Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Perez. Uh, I know you've been on the board for a long time, and you've probably heard heard our reports, and we appreciate your, your thoughts, and we appreciate you attending, uh, having a time to sort of step down from the DS there and just visit with us and have a meal and just get to know each other a little bit better. Mr. President. Mr. Manning. I would like to thank you for the fact that how respectful you approach our citizens about back taxes and everything. I was thinking that you just don't big, uh, put Big Mom out on the porch and everything. I think that's very important in a lot of areas in this community. So my hat is off to you and please keep, it, keep up the good work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Manning. We sure will. And well, another comment, and yes, you, you visit with us every year, give us an outstanding report. And uh, your efforts are always well recognized, and uh, uh, the uh, results speak for themselves. I mean, we appreciate all the work that you do on behalf of the district uh, in, in working with these collection efforts, and the approaches you take with our taxpayers is very important to us, and you're very respective of that. And all the work that you do that uh, you've just mentioned tonight in terms of not only the collections work, but the audit work and the monitoring work you do. All very important aspects of our relationship and the work that you do for us. And uh, we can't thank you enough for the efforts that you all put forth on our behalf. And we thank you very much. So. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sykes. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Nelson. Thank you. So obviously your, your report is impressive and we appreciate your relationship with the school district. <clears throat> What I wanted to ask is understanding how complex property tax reform is becoming. And as we have two years to prepare for the legislative session, I guess I would just ask you to guide us. You know, obviously, 
one of the main things I heard from your presentation is that you went back and looked at the change in our taxable values <clears throat> and were able to get us back almost a million dollars. So that's impressive, and I know that you do that annually, but I just want to get ahead of, I want to be more proactive. You know, I, I think because of the way the state funding formula works, because of our property taxes, we're going to lose state aid. And so, you know, our chief financial officer has made that very clear to this board, and that's going to hit us in 24 months in our budget. And so I just want to seek some guidance, counsel, if you will, so that we can um, actively communicate with our legislators about school finance and how it impacts, and then pro obviously property tax reform is a citywide issue, and we want the school district to participate in, in that conversation, along with the Greater Waco Chamber of Commerce and other entities in a way that advocates for our school district. Well, Dr. Nelson, we'll be certainly glad to keep you and the staff and the board apprised of, of legislation as it goes through the process. I know it can have a major impact on the funding for the school district, and uh, it's very significant um, of what's going to be happening in the next 24 months when the legislature gets back together again. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. May we proceed, Mr. Chairman? Item 10B. Discussion update on continuous improvement government's work. Goal progress measures 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, this is continuing the outstanding work of this board um, that has made a commitment. Uh, for the record, the first board goal in our Lone Star governance framework is to increase the percentage of third grade students reading on grade level as measured by STAR from 54% to 83% by 2020. And this presentation is an overview of our reading program and it specifically addresses third grade students reading on grade level, first grade students reading on grade level, and second grade students reading on grade level. And I'd like to thank uh, our assistant superintendent of elementary uh, Mrs. Grace Benson for preparing this uh, presentation. If there's no introductory comments or questions, I'll turn it over to her for this presentation. Mrs. Benson. Good evening, Dr. Nelson and esteemed board of trustees. I'm here tonight to share the progress on our board goal one that Dr. Nelson um, shared so well. Um, Before going further and sharing our progress in reading, I would like to give you insight into the assessment that we use to monitor our students' progress in reading. ICIP I -station, is, stands for iStation Indicators of Progress. ICIP is a computer adaptive testing system that adjusts the difficulty level of each question based on the response provided by the student. For example, when a child cannot answer a question, the difficulty level drops until the assessment finds the exact level of performance of that child in reading. If a child answers a question correctly, the difficulty level then increases. The objective of ICIP is to identify the students potentially at risk for reading failure. For the purpose of monitoring progress in our reading goal, we use ICIP Early Reading, which assesses the five critical areas of early reading. Once a, child is, once a child takes the assessment, the child is then put on a level in a tiered system. Tier one is students performing at grade level. Tier two, students performing below grade level and in need of intervention. In tier three, students performing seriously below grade level and in need of intensive intervention. ICIP assesses the five critical domains of early reading, phonemic awareness, alphabetic knowledge and skills, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Phonemic awareness is a subset of phonological awareness in which students hear, identify, and manipulate phonemes, the smallest units of sound that make meaning. An example of how we do this with children is when we, ask, when we ask them to say the word cat, 
and then have them replace the k sound with a p sound. And then they have to manipulate those phonemes. I always remind teachers when we're working in professional development that for phonemic awareness, we only need our ears. Alphabetic knowledge is when students move to only using their ears to also using their eyes as well. It is the ability to name letters, distinguish letter shapes, and identify their sounds. The test also assesses fluency. If you ask many students, they will, think, they will tell you that fluency is being able to read really fast. Um, and this is really neat because when I've worked with students in the past, you know, when they don't have that understanding of fluency, that's exactly what they do when you test them. They read as fast as they can, often missing capital is, you know, punctuation with very little prosody and intonation. It's actually, when you are be able to read fluently, it's actually when you are able to read at a rate in which not only you can recognize the words in print with automaticity, but you can also make meaning at the same time. It's a very important skill for reading. <clears throat> One of the things that I always share with teachers when we talk about fluency and when they're working with students is we want to really work on fluency. We can't miss working on fluency because when students at our level, when they're not doing well in fluency and they're expending their mental energy trying to decode words, we can't move them to higher levels of comprehension. We want them to save their brain power for comprehension. Students who aren't fluent spend all their time trying to tackle unknown words. We also test vocabulary in ISIP. Readers cannot understand what they're reading without knowing what most of the words mean. In fact, comprehension is largely made up of vocabulary, which is one of the reasons it's one of Dr. Nelson's Super 7. It's essential in reading. And for comprehension, this is also assessed in the test. Comprehension is basically making meaning from text, making connections with what we read, it starts at the word level, and then students move to comprehending at the sentence level, then at the paragraph level, and then they move on to more difficult text. Some students struggle so much at the word level that they cannot even begin to comprehend at the sentence level. And like I shared before, they expend all of their brain energy trying to decode words. On the next slide, what you will see is what a typical report looks like on iStation. You can also break down reports into specific reading areas. And if our esteemed board or Dr. Nelson ever wants me to bring that type of report, if you ever want to look at specific areas of reading, I will be happy to do that. Ma'am, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So just for um, common understanding, if you go back to the last slide, so it's reasonable then that our pre-K children would have the lowest percentage of tier one. Yes. Because they're just beginning their formal school experience. Yes, sir. And that's where we tend to see our biggest gains. Yes, sir. Because of their ability to uh, soak up the outstanding instruction from our teachers. Yes, sir. So I won't go into that in any detail other than to try to explain that slide a little bit about the 39% for pre-K, 50% uh, for second grade is impressive. That means 50% mm -hmm. of our second graders. See, what should happen is, is that ultimately, the way we're designing our instructional program, it's intended to be intense, pre-K three, pre-K four, kindergarten. And the more kids we can get reading on grade level coming out of kindergarten, we believe will um, really address our equity challenges and our achievement gaps. And so it's kind of hard to address an achievement gap in the sixth grade. Yes. Uh, but it's really uh, over time through stable leadership, uh, we, we're trying to address it by the time kids enter kindergarten, knowing what they need to know to take advantage of our, our teachers. Yes, sir. Continue. On the next slide, you will see a comparison of last year's performance to this year's performance. In kindergarten, we had a slight drop of 1% at the beginning of the school year. 
However, in first grade, we had an increase of 4%. In second grade, we've already increased 7%. And in third grade, 4%. This assessment is from the very beginning of the school year. Here, I've broken down the results for each specific checkpoint. During September of 2017, 44% of students were at Tier 1 in comparison to 45% in 2016. During September of 2017, 41% of students were at Tier 1 in comparison to 37 in 2016. And during September of 2017, 50% of students were at Tier 1 in comparison with 43% in 2016. I have an additional, additional information for you. Here I've broken it down by percentage points gained. In pre-kindergarten, we had a gain of 6% when compared to last school year. As I shared, kindergarten had a slight drop of 1%. First grade had an increase of 4%, and second grade had an increase of 7%. Beginning of year results also indicate growth in third grade. Third grade increased by 4% in September, and we already have pulled reports for October, which are showing um, gains there as well. In October, for example, 53% of students were at tier one, which is reading at grade level, in comparison to only 45% in 2016. This is a growth of 8% for our third graders when compared to last school year. And I'd like to introduce our reading coaches. They're here. Sure. They're been, they've been working very hard um, with not only teachers, but they've also been working directly with students. We also have one of our reading content specialists, Ms. Donna Trigg. Um, these gains and these scores are attributed to our wonderful teachers, the leadership in our campuses, and the really hard, hard work of the wonderful people that are here tonight that are not only working with teachers, but also directly impacting children. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. <clears throat> Come in. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, really what we're trying to emphasize, with all due respect to Lone Star Governance, and obviously we've already provided evidence that this board has been looking at this goal for over a year as a focus, but what we're trying to do is increase uh, community awareness about our challenge with literacy. And if we could just fix our literacy challenge, we would solve so many of our instructional um, issues. And so we just want to spread that message. Everyone needs to be reading more books. Everyone needs to be teaching three-year-olds that words go from left to right. Uh, we need so, so proud of some of our partnering organizations that are bringing thousands and thousands of books uh, to our kids so that they can increase our libraries. We're trying to get fiercely competitive with our accelerated reader program, uh, almost to a fault, <laughs> as much as we want kids to read a book, take a test, and really we're gonna recognize the top kid in every grade level for accelerated readers. So I just wanted to highlight literacy as being uh, really the, you know, people ask me all the time, so what do you think so far? And what do you, well, we fix literacy, we fix our whole problem. And it really begins at pre-K three and goes all the way through our seniors. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Manning. Mr. Manning. Mrs. Benson. Yes, sir. In looking at the chart on student performance at rate levels, the blue is for 2016, 2017, and the, uh, well, what color that is for 2017-2018? Yes, sir. If I'm looking at the first grade blue for uh, 2017, it says 37 percent. Does that translate over to the uh, second rate 50 percent for 2017-2018? Uh, this is those the same cohort students. No, sir. That is, those are those are. This is looking year to year progress. Year to year. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the but if you were looking at pre kindergarten from last year, those would be the kindergarten students for this year. So that's a very good question. Yes, sir. 
Okay, what, kindergarten for 2016, 2017? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So kindergarten that you're seeing right now for 20, 2017, 2018, those will be our first graders when I, when I show that next year. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Good question. Ms. Tekel. Okay, I'm, I'm back to looking at our goals and, and um, I'm, I, forgive me, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if our goal makes sense. So we're trying to measure, we're trying, we're, we're looking at our progress toward our goal of increasing the percentage of third graders reading on grade level from 54 to 83%. And so tonight we're looking at what we decided would show whether or not we were making progress toward that goal, which was this ICIP program. Yes. Right? Okay. So we said that if we have 45% of our kindergartners reading on grade level in 2017, <coughs> then that would, uh, we should feel confident that we're going to make our overarching goal. And so then I'm looking at the data you've, I'm, I guess I'm confused at what point in time mm -hmm. are we measuring this annual growth? Is, is this 45% in October or is this at the beginning of the year? Is it 45% at the end of the school year when they complete mm -hmm. kindergarten? I'm sorry, I'm good. May I respond to that, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Uh, please yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Benson, but <clears throat> this is beginning of the year data. This but, is our beginning of the but year. But we year also year. give end of the year data. Yes. And that's the data that will really be, were we successful or not? Yes, sir. So, you know, for example, on third grade, we're already at 47%. Mm -hmm. yes. We were supposed to be at 45%. Mm -hmm. okay. But that's really, the question is, what was our data last spring? Yes. And so we're kind of, we're moving ahead. See what I'm saying? Which you can kind of see, would that be 43 Yes. At the end of the year? Uh, for third grade, I mean. It was 43 at the end of the year? We have it for up to second grade. Okay, so I'm looking at this chart that the public is looking at, mm -hmm. and the last column says third grade, and the blue column is 2016, 2017. Those oh, kids yes. got a 43. Yes. And that was in May. Yes. Right, and yes, so, so we're. That was, well, actually, that was when I did when I did that chart. This chart right here. This is for the beginning of the school year. Last year. Yes, sir. So uh, yes, uh, sir. September of 2016. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what um, we will present again at the middle of the school year for the mid-year progress measure, and then again as Dr. Nelson shared at the end of the year, and then we'll know. And that's if the we, one that if counts. We made our the goal. End of the year. So that's a very good question. Okay. So, so it's a progress report, so to speak. It's a progress yes, report, but it's um, we're going to be following ICIP scores throughout the school year. Yes, ma'am. Right? Yes, ma'am. Because this three was, times a year. Okay. Because mm -hmm. because the um, Lone Star Governance required us to check these quarterly, right? Right. Progress. Okay. Right. Okay. And I'm also monitoring them on a monthly basis as well. Okay, so then, so then my question is, if we're looking at beginning of the year data, have you looked at whether, I mean, what does this mean toward mm -hmm. achieving this goal right. of, let's say, oh, well, what you're saying is we've already exceeded the 45% in kindergarten? So it's 47 for, oh, we, no, kindergarten, we actually have 44. Yes. Not yet in kindergarten, right, not but in we're kindergarten. getting close in some of the others. For, for um, second grade, at the end of the school year, we will need to be at 60%. 60, 60 and where are we right now? Right now, we are at 47%. Okay. So that's that. a very good question okay. as well. Okay, and do that again for me in first grade. Where are we now? In first grade, we will need, we will need to be at 50%. And then right now in first grade, we are at 41%. Last year at this time, we were at 37%. Okay, so, sorry, one more question. So, to make sense, and as you're reporting to us, are you telling us that you're happy with no. what you're seeing and whether we're making any, are, mm -hmm. are we on track to meet these goals 
and maybe it's too early to say. Uh, let me answer that. Yes. Uh, you can, you yes, can add to my Absolutely. response. We're, we're dissatisfied with this data. Um, as I said earlier, literacy continues to be mm -hmm. our, our most serious instructional construct that we're, we're facing. And when we walk into our classrooms, there is an achievement gap yes. that is by reading grade level. As any kindergarten teacher, some are here tonight, they will tell you that you have one kid reading on fourth grade level and you have another kid who doesn't even understand the concept of phonemic awareness. Yes. And so differentiating instruction to where um, the achievement gap is closed, for the record, is our biggest problem, mm -hmm. Mrs. T. Kell. It is a, now we're, you know, we're making improvements. Mm -hmm. It's not an indictment. I really applaud Mrs. Benson and all of our reading team for taking this so serious. But we're understaffed in that area. We need more reading coaches. They're stretched thin. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to put them where kids need help the most yes. and um, all of our teachers will tell you if they could get their groups smaller and really work on the instruction they could eliminate some of these gaps but we're doing the best we can with what we have so it is to answer your question it is a problem we're not trying to suggest we've arrived uh, mm -hmm. we're just trying to exist we're really trying to emphasize we need help with this from the community and everyone should be focusing on literacy all of our technology programs should have a literacy component. Uh, what we do with family engagement should include literacy. Uh, all of our communications should focus on that area. And we, we believe that this will help us in all of our core areas if we will focus on this. Ms. Benson, did you want to add anything? Yes, we, and when you mentioned the community, we are reaching out to our community partners because as Dr. Nelson said, it is a critical and urgent need. Our, our, our reading, where we are in reading in our district, I am not satisfied with it at all. I know that our students can do it, but we need everyone working with us. And I know our students will do it. I know our schools will do it. But we have students right now in third grade that are having trouble decoding at the word level. And that's why I wanted to share with you and, 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 and go over the different a, components with you. That's because a kindergarten a child, concept. Mm -hmm. And if a child is missing one of those concepts, it affects all of their overall literacy. And you know, we've reached out to our community partners. Um, I've, I've been working with Baylor, and we were able to get graduate students to come to Crestview so that we could make the group smaller there um, during intervention. And they'll be starting next week. And so we are really trying to reach out to everyone we can so that we can help our students. But it's going to take everyone. You know, we have people all the time ask us, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. And if people would just make a commitment to come and help one struggling reader catch up, then that would help. Now, the issue is, as we've said in our community meetings, uh, we need mentors and volunteers that are going to commit. Yes. This can't be some half commitment and the kids sitting there waiting for you right after lunch yes. and you don't show. So we've got to have people who say, no, nah, I'm going to take little Juanito or little Juanita and I'm going to teach them how to read. And it may take me six months, but that relationship, that, that uh, balance of pressure and support, uh, we're going we're gonna to get all of our kids on the right track. Right. Any other comments? Dr. Dr. Nelson. Oh, sorry. Ms. Press. Uh, just, uh, question, just curiosity. Uh, why? You know, these children, they learn differently. Uh, mm -hmm. What? Uh, grade do these children get uh, homework assignments reading assignments mm -hmm. what, age, at what grade do they actually take all grade them? levels all grade yes levels. sir yes. all grade levels do they have a, a log to where the parents can can say okay he read a book two books and so forth the, yes yeah, some of, some of the schools have that and yes they they do you know and we also have a program leveled literacy intervention where the students do have take home books that they take home and they read um, with with their families and dr mcdurham is um, 
and she's here. She, um, along with Dr. Nelson, I mean, they have a huge literacy initiative um, to get books in the hands of children because many of our families, they don't have books at home. And so if they don't have the books that we send home for, you know, leveled literacy or, you know, we also have a, a program reading A to Z and the teachers can print out books to send home to the children. If we don't have that, they don't have anything at home. And so we are working hard to get books into the hands of children. And because what you just shared, you know, if they have to do it at home. It's not enough to do it at school. You need to do it at home well, at, at home as well. And I, I've even had parents in the advisory council um, for our English learners. I've even asked parents that have asked me, you know, they have said, I don't speak English. I, I don't know how I can read to my child. And I say, read to them in the language that you speak. Then, we, then they'll be biliterate. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll learn. They'll learn the nuances of language, whether it's in English or in Spanish. They still hear the, the rhythm of what literacy looks like. And, you know, and so we encourage all of our parents to read to their children, regardless of, of the language. And we encourage it. Um, and, and I'm very excited about the um, literacy event that Dr. McDurham has put together. It's going to be a huge event where our parents are going to, you know, the children will be able to pick out two books to take home. And they'll get to pick it. You know, they'll get to pick the books. And so that's going to be really exciting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so, so I'm continuing to, to um, think about whether or not this goal progress measure report, although I have to say the conversation in the last five or ten minutes has probably been what the, what the purpose of this, right, the intent. But are we measuring what we should be measuring because, we, again, it, I get this report and it's it's so hard to make any sense out of. Um, and then it's taken a while and um, to explain, and I'm just wondering if our progress measures are meaningful. Um, and like you say, some of the numbers we've already hit, and do we need to reconsider? Um, and these were done before you came, well, and, and I'd, I'd be open to your ideas on that. Well, if you'll give us some time, we'll go back and look at each one. And we've already been looking at our progress measures for all of our goals. And, you know, we talked about in Kate, we need to revisit some of them. And we may need to do that in reading as well. Yes. We do believe that if the goal that the board set is in the area of third grade reading, then it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that staff should start with second, first, kindergarten, pre-K yes. reading if you're measuring third grade. And that starts with second graders and it just goes down from there in terms of getting the uh, playing field level. I'd like to commend, you know, not only Dr. McDurham for her literacy event with uh, tamales and literacy. Um, I know our local teacher association is bringing thousands of books uh, to uh, our kids. And I know Mr. Carrera is helping organize that. For the record, YMCA is doing a summer initiative. Mr. Rodney Martin, the CEO, and uh, he's bringing thousands of books. Uh, so we're we're thinking, you know, we take out billboards if we thought more people would read, you know. Yes. So we just want to emphasize that. And Mrs. T. Kell's point is is true, and it's really the Lone Star governance work. You kind of got to continuously review your targets yes. and see if they need to be re revisited, but. Third grade students reading on grade level would change our district if we yes. could get to 83%. It'll change their lives. Absolutely. Every, every child does not, that does not, the statistics, their life, the quality of their life, it, it is incredible the different life that children will have if they can read at grade level by third grade with children that cannot. There's dire consequences if children cannot read at grade level by third grade, and it only gets harder after that. The consequences only increase. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Ms. Quarterly? Uh, looking at this slide here in particular, 2016 school year to 2017, 2017, 2018, I want to commend you guys for the uh, gains. Thank because you. You. research shows that summer slide is a real thing. Students yes. drop one to two grade levels at, over the summer. 
So that, this indication right here is showing something is happening on a campus level um, that is preventing that. Yes. Uh, whether the students are getting above grade level and then come back and, you know, are, yeah. I, 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 th I think this is a testament to y'all's hard work. It is, um, I think we see it, I saw it as, a, as an educator every year. Our yes. students would, would drop, and it, it's, it's kind of unbelievable some of the drop that they would make as far as grade level. Um, so I just want to commend you guys for the hard work. That is, that's hard work. Thank you very much. It's, our, it's a team. Yeah, the, team. Um, and, and I know it goes Thank you. from team to teachers to administrators yes. to everyone working to community partners. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it does, it takes, it takes a village. My, uh, my thought on this as we're looking at this gold measure, or the, the progress measure, is the school year ends in 2018. Mm -hmm. So technically our goal is 55% by the mm -hmm. end of this mm -hmm. school year. For, yeah, yeah, we're yes. talking about the baseline end of, end of 2017. Mm -hmm. And so we are, if we look at this in kindergarten, you know, we're at 44, we need to be at 55. Yes. We're in first grade, we are at 41 and we need to be at 60. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so, so these are definitely stretch goals, I yes. think, for us. Yes. So my question for you was, as I was looking at the Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3, um, how many of those percentages, so I know you're doing ICIP, mm -hmm. does that ICIP give the teachers and the campuses the information that they need kind of on the spot to tweak their lessons, to kind of go through and do that? Does it give an instantaneous yes. feedback? I, I'm so glad you asked about that. It actually does. If it's done the way it should be, and, and I, I will tell you, um, Lisa Monti um, are, works with us, and you know she is, uh, she is works with us on all of our educational software, ensuring that teachers understand how to use the programs and are using them with fidelity. She has been working with all of the campuses along with Mr. Paul Mock and they have been training campuses. Um, I gave them a deadline to ensure that every campus was trained on the correct use of ICIP because if they're using it correctly, we can also trust this data, but at the same time, they're using the tools that it has and that's exactly what it has. If, if, if a child is at a tier three level, it will recommend specific interventions for that child, but the teacher will have to differentiate, as Dr. Nelson shared, and work with that child. And, and that's where we see you know, gains when they're actually, but it does, it, it gives some interventions and strategy suggestions. So then would it be fair to say, or I don't know if you have this information, how much of our tier two students move off of tier two into tier one at the end of the year? You know, just what the percentage is. Spoken, on that spoken like a teacher That's on the board. That's right. Yeah, I, yeah. Actually, I would, love to, I would love to pull that for yeah, you we'll because it. actually if we, if we get strong in our interventions, we will see students going from tier three even to tier two we wouldn't expect them to go right away from tier three to one, but we will see our students starting to drop to tier one from, from tier, tier two. And I can pull that data for you. I would, just, that's something I'm interested in. Just for very historical much. reference so that we can see, okay, are we moving these students? Are we moving the bar? Are we moving the students from tier two to tier one by yes. the end of the year? Are we lessening our tier three? What have we done with that last year? And what can we kind of predict for this year? just in terms of meeting our goal. Absolutely, and in a district as ours where many of our students are at tier two and tier three, I think that what you're asking is so relevant and it's something that I'm, I'm looking at as well because with, when you have so many students at tier two and three, you need to become an expert on interventions. Yeah. You need to be able to intervene. Yeah, and the, I just kind of wanted to echo what you were saying as far as the reading, uh, the need for it, Annie and Casey Foundation came out with a research that says students aren't reading on third grade reading level. They're eight times less likely to graduate. You add poverty and adverse uh, childhood um, uh, experiences, and then you, you, you bump it up to 13 times. Yeah. So this is a, a critical piece, I think, and is foundational in terms of um, students making progress in math 
in science and social studies yes. just for the rest of their academic career. So I think I commend you for um, uh, making gains even over the summer is what it looks like to me. I commend you for doing that, and I think we need uh, just kind of what Dr. Nelson said, uh, more community programs that will kind of help, and like the YMCA, I know they do stuff with summer programming, and, and, and just more community involvement in that to really kind of help us shore up some of those, um, I don't know, yeah, the gaps, some of those, those yes. gaps. So. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Mr. Manning. Ms. Benson, um, I'm very aware of, of meeting I just came from with the NAACP. I know that there is some organizations, some sororities, some fraternities, they're gearing up to make a push to help us. That's now, my wonderful. question is that, are we, what are we going to do to support these volunteers, mm -hmm. to make sure that the work they are doing will be also in, in alignment with what you guys are already doing? Mm -hmm. Because some of this work, they uh, uh, one suggestion is that uh, let's go to a church on the weekend, bring students in to read. Mm -hmm. But is there anything that we can do as a district to help support this initiative mm -hmm. and make sure that, you, I mean, I, I hate to use the term wasting that. Yes. Wasting, wasting the, the person's time or wasting yes. the kid's time and you are not achieving anything that's going to be helping them when they come to school the next right. year. Right, absolutely. Are we going to do anything to try and support these groups? You know, um, one of the things that I did when I was a principal and we we had many organizations that wanted to help is we used to do a curriculum night where we would teach community volunteers all about our curriculum and so we'd have teachers come from first grade second grade third grade and they would talk about the expectations for that grade level and basically work with the volunteers so that when they came in they knew exactly what the students needed help on it was if you're going to come to our school and respect respectfully so if they're going to come to the school and help the students number one they'd have to be working with us on the teaks aligning to the teaks and working with specific skills for that child at that grade level and and you know our our teachers we are so in need of that help and we would work with them to do events like that, like curriculum nights where we could invite them to learn about our curriculum so that it isn't wasted time, but instead we're building more awareness about what our students need to be able to do in the classroom. Because every year, you know, that, that level is raised higher and higher. And so if they can work with us, if they can work alongside of us and they can learn about the TEKS, that, that right there alone would be huge but they have to be working with us, you, well, you know, I, on the team. I teams. know some people, I will get in contact with them and get them in contact with you because of the fact that, like I said, there is a concentrated effort that's yes. going on right now to get volunteers and mentors to go into, especially our RR schools, to help them. But like I said, I want them to come in and be an asset. We don't need to be wasting time with Yes. Them. I mean, because this is very, I mean, as you say, this is very critical. It is, it's so. critical. And I'll give you an example. What we did with the graduate students at Baylor that you know wanted to help is, we spent a day with them at Baylor and they were trained on the level literacy intervention. The level literacy intervention at Crestview is an integral part. It's a critical part of the reading intervention. So if they were gonna come and help us, that's where we would need their help. And so these graduate students are now trained in that intervention and they're gonna actually be pulling groups of students. So I, I thank you for that, for so your help. We would be willing to go ahead and do this. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Manning. We, we, we need the help. Well, like we said, need it. I, I, there, there is a concentrated effort that's going on right now. There's, uh, there was a sheet passed out um, at the recent NAACP meeting asking people for how many hours you want to delegate. But like I said, if they are not in there working to increase the uh, uh, performance level mm -hmm. of these students, literacy, literacy yes. level, I mean, we just kind of spinning our wheels. Yes, okay. yes, sir. I will, I will work on that. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Mr. Perez. One quick uh, question or comment. Uh, now, Baylor has a summer reading program. 
and uh, it's it's costly for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, are there? Have we checked to? If there's any grants out there that could cover some of the students, like especially the ones that are tier three. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you know of any grants or anything? There? I can certainly look into that. I would be very happy to look into that. I know right now um, I'm working, I'm going to be meeting with Ms. Cooper about Mila so that we're going to start working on that now early in the year so that we can continue that math program and expand it in the summer. But I would be, I would be very happy to look into that for our students, especially the Tier 3. See, that's another example of where people may not have the time because of their professional schedule or their family commitments to actually come in and tutor and work with a kid, like Trustee Manning mentioned, but they could sponsor a kid to that summer program mm -hmm. or That's sponsor right. one boy and one girl, you That's know, right. something like that. So mm -hmm. uh, we're looking for help in any way we can get it, and we're going to be working hard to improve this either way. Yes, sir. Any other comments or questions from the trustees? Ms. Benson, thank you for your report. Thank and you. Uh, one, yes, one final question. ICIP is a goal progress measurement tool. Yes, sir. Have we fully implemented it across the district? Yes, sir. It's implemented not at the high school level, but we do implement it at all grade levels at the elementary level, and we use it for math at the at middle school level. Okay. So software, technology mm -hmm. software. Yes, sir. It used to be free by the state mm -hmm. of Texas, mm -hmm. and now... It has a small price attached to it. I shouldn't say small. It has a price attached to it. <laughs> so you're reporting data collected from every school then? Yes, sir. Okay. We actually, for, for this report, we, it's, it's, showing the, it's showing the results for over 5,000 students at the elementary level. Okay. Very good. Thank you for your report. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. Okay. Uh, if there's no other questions at this time, we'll proceed to item. Thank you. 11 announcements, but before I do, I had a silent alarm that went off that indicated that we've got a guest with us. Uh, Mr. Doug McDermott, I believe, we entered in the back door and he's hiding behind a column over there. I think he's taking notes on our meeting to take back as a, as a representative of the Board of Trustees. We got you covered, Doug, so yeah. thanks for being with us. All Good right. to see you. All right. Announcements. That would be our Executive Director of Communications and Family Engagement, Mr. Kyle DeBeer. Mr. DeBeer. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Three things I wanted to touch on this evening. First, we're really excited for Saturday when the Waco High School Band heads to Birdville ISD Stadium. At 3.15 p.m., they take the field to perform in the UIL Area Marching Contest. Uh, this week, we kicked off a series of community meetings to discuss the challenges and deadline facing some of our schools. The next meeting in that series will be next Monday, October 30th at 6 p.m. at the City of Waco Multipurpose Center on Elm Avenue. And then the following Monday, we'll hold the third community meeting at 6 p.m. That's November 6th at the Syntax Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And then the night after that on November 7th is the literacy event that you've already heard a little bit about. This is a family engagement event that we're incredibly excited about. We will have events at both Waco High School and University High School for the students in the respective school's feeder patterns. Every student in grades three through five will be able to take home a book. We'll have dinner available for all of the families joining us and special activities to help parents learn how they can make the most out of the book that they're taking home and have an enriching experience reading with their children and supporting their child's literacy. So that'll start at 6 p.m. at uh, Waco High School and University High School, depending on which feeder pattern you're in as a middle school or elementary student. And so it's a, it's a busy month, but those are certainly some of the highlights before our next board meeting. Thank you, Mr. Beer. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We saw someone to emphasize um, to our Spanish public. I'm going to ask Ms. Benson to come up and explain. Can you come up and explain in Spanish real quick that um, our community meetings, we do have translation services available. So if we can make that clear. Sure. Para nuestras familias hispanas que nos están mirando en el canal, 
tenemos, vamos a tener en las, en las um, reuniones que tenemos en la comunidad, vamos a tener intérpretes ahí para ustedes. Queremos invitarlos, queremos que ustedes estén con nosotros. La voz de ustedes de nuestra comunidad hispana es muy importante. Y si vienen, vamos a tener intérpretes para que entiendan lo que el doctor Marcus Nelson está hablando. Y todo lo que estamos hablando es muy importante sobre las escuelas en Hueco ISD. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, also, just one note to follow up what Dr. Uh, Mr. DeBeer said was that anyone watching tonight, tell your friends, tell your family, uh, please join us for those community <coughs> events that have been announced. Uh, uh, we've had one already. It was extremely important exchange of information, and uh, it, it's all about gathering up diverse inputs and uh, working with the community to find solutions. So. Uh, we encourage anybody that's available to come out and visit with us that night and provide inputs that we're that we're needing so desperately to move the district ahead. So, if there are no other agenda items, I'll obtain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I want to ask for all approved. All approved. We're good. <laughs>